Good evening, good morrow and good day and welcome to another Campaign Diary and Q&A here on Slice and Dice talking about everything that went down in the last two sessions of the Many Lands campaign but I will also be talking about The Cage uh, and the latest episode of that as well as some uh, changes that are coming here on Slice and Dice to our regular scheduling. Uh, I probably should do that first actually because I announced in the last session uh, that at least in the short term uh, we're going to scale back the Many Lands campaign to uh, every other week rather than weekly as it currently is. And this isn't through uh, uh, any other reason other than I just have too much going on and needed a bit of a break, really. Um, just uh, obviously DMing every week takes a lot of energy, takes a lot of time to plan out stuff. And obviously I'm writing a lot of the stuff as well. So, you know, that that combined with also trying to hold down all of my other work that I do outside of uh, streaming here because I don't get paid to do this this is all kind of of my own volition really um, it, it's uh, it, it is quite stressful and it, it does take its toll and so you know without wanting to sour the experience because we in really enjoy playing this game and I want it to continue in that fashion I didn't ever want it to become a chore so I think that moving it back a bit um, to every other week just meant that it frees up that time for me to then prepare uh, things and give my, my life some breathing space as well because I do feel like I'm constantly just on the go and just can't stop which is not a nice feeling um, and it's not also it's also not very conducive to being creative and especially when I'm coming up with ideas for plot lines stories and the rest of it uh, and characters of course for this campaign it can uh, it can just really take its toll and, and I don't want it to be a detriment. So really it's a quality over quantity choice. But that's not to say that we're going to have any uh, big changes to our Monday night scheduling because what we are now going to be doing is uh, our new series The Cage, which is an exclusive YouTube series, uh, will then be aired every alternate Monday. So when we don't have the Many Lands campaign on Twitch, we will have uh, The Cage on YouTube. So you'll have uh, you'll have at least one thing to watch every Monday which means that of, I hope that some of you guys who are regular viewers of the many lands will then also jump over and have a look at the cage as well um, it's a for those of you who haven't seen it before it's uh, a campaign run by my friend uh, DM Stephen uh, uh, with a completely separate group the only kind of link between the many lands campaign and uh and to the cage is myself and then angelique who's currently guest starring in the many lands she's also one of the regular players in the cage campaign um it's a completely different setting it's a planescape setting game uh it's uh, been very intriguing so far we just had our latest session last night and that will be going live on monday so if you haven't subscribed to our youtube channel already I suggest you do so because you'll be uh, notified when the premiere of uh, our next episode, episode four, goes live. Uh, so you wouldn't want to miss that. So make sure you uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already. Uh, and of, of course, if you're following us here on Twitch, very much appreciated. And if you subscribe to us on Twitch, thank you so much. It really does mean a lot. Our episodes uh, from The Cage will also be dropping onto Twitch as well. So don't fear, it will be here as well. Um, and speaking of following us uh, here on Twitch, a big thank you to our most recent followers. I haven't done this for a couple of weeks. Um, uh, first of all, thank you, Lady Kilala, who I remember talking to in the last Campaign Diary in Q&A, uh, or Milady. Uh, Unflavored Pizza Zero Zero, Brick the Simp, and Mark, Z, uh, Mark X Red. Thank you all for following us. And a big thank you uh, to uh, Pichowski, who uh, has subscribed to us here uh, on Twitch. Thank you so much. It really does mean a lot. Um, so, yeah, um, it's a positive change, really. I know uh, that that means that you're getting slightly less of the Melee Lands or it's being drawn out over a longer time period, but it's just going to make everything better for all of us here. Um, and one final exciting announcement uh, on the Many Lands, which uh, news came to me only just today. Uh, we will be having another guest star coming in very, very soon. While uh, uh, it could be in the next session, I have a feeling it, it will be in session 59. So not the next session, but the one after that our next guest will be joining us. And this guest, uh, TV star uh, and film, uh, and I can't say anything more about it than that, but a good friend of mine from university uh, and uh, uh, very excited to have him on board. So uh, we will we'll see more about that when we get to it. Um, but for now, uh, yeah, if you're not following us already, you want to be notified when our next uh, uh, campaign goes up, 
our next session of the campaign goes up uh, then hit that follow button here on twitch uh, and on uh, youtube subscribe to us we really do appreciate it it means that you'll be first to know when those videos go up and go live so um speaking of uh, the cage one last time this uh, next episode episode four which is dropping on monday night at six o'clock so that's our normal time on monday nights um is uh, very very intriguing stuff about that in fact i'm thinking with campaign diaries i'll have a section where i talk about the cage um as well or possibly possibly maybe doing a friday one about the cage at some point maybe if, if i've got it in me but i'll say for now we'll pull them both together into one uh into into one video but uh the next episode uh of the cage um more planescaping uh, and uh, plane jumping frolics uh <laughs> avoiding litigation as much as possible there was quite a lot of litigation in episode three uh due to automata's uh, rigorous uh um uh, <laughs> form signing and form filling uh which uh just drove us all a little bit insane we managed to avoid most of that in this next episode and then there's more shenanigans uh hopping through uh planes but equally uh by the end of session four it was then announced that we'll be leveling up so our characters are going finally from level two to level three and now for most classes and for four of our um, players uh, four of our player characters in the cage that's a big level level three that's when you choose your subclass so going forward after that it's gonna be really interesting to see which subclasses they choose and how those characters kind of develop and change upon leveling up and for the other two that's uh, myself the wizard and uh, angelique playing the cleric um, we've already got our subclasses so it just meant second level spells baby second level spells at third level and also that you double the amount of spell slots you get as well at level three from level two so a big change and a, a positive one um so we'll be very excited to play episode five in a couple of weeks time uh, anyway that's enough about the cage let's move on focus on the last couple of episodes of the many lands campaign so uh following um session uh 54 55 uh which was basically one big punch up uh, it was a massive fight that sprawled over the two sessions um 56 was really kind of the calm after the storm it was the uh the kind of the gathering up of the bodies quite literally um fleeting look had uh, had been uh, slain uh, he had dr he'd been pulled underwater whilst unconscious by the giant lurking snake and then had succumbed uh, to drowning uh, while he was underwater Seth uh, not in time to bring him out of that and helps not helped by the uh, snakes uh, uh, these the brood of the giant lurking snake which was nipping at his lifeless body uh, which really didn't help matters at all but anyway uh Fleeting was dragged out of the water and uh, they got Malar the cleric to uh, f get over to him with the diamond that Seth had only given him a couple of days ago uh, in the hopes that he could bring him back with Revivify. Now, uh, Rules has written on the spell for Revivify. Uh, you need to uh, revive somebody. You need to use that spell within a minute of that uh, person dying. Now, it was, up for <laughs> it was up for debate. We weren't sure... Where I, I think honestly it may have been over a minute but it was right on the cusp and uh, you know rather than it being a simple case of if it's within a minute it works and if it's after a minute it fails you know there's that that grey bit in the middle where it's what if it's exactly on a minute what happens then now as I said because it was uh, because it was debatable uh, and equally because Dan himself the player um, has not been able to, to come back to the campaign yet uh, the kind of uh, the the route that made the most sense really was actually for him to be stabilized so it worked the spell um but he is currently in a coma um and so uh, he's kind of being dragged around by the rest of the party but they they can't really do anything uh, with him in this lifeless but alive form so they uh so it was uh, it was probably quite fortunate really that they had uh, uh, slain the three bounty hunters that had come after them and were in fact they were looking for Seth and they wanted to take him back with them was really their goal um, but uh, it was quite fortunate because they had brought along uh, a a magical item uh, cadence's graphite slate which is quite literally a bounty hunter's best tool uh, it's kind of uh, i think there was definitely some influence from like the uh, freezing hand in carbonite in the empire strikes back that that kind of floating block essentially uh, that uh, rather than the with graphite slate rather than it uh, the character being encased inside this thing 
kind of cocooned inside. It's more like if you imagine Tensor's floating disc, but with magical uh, kind of uh, shackles that then uh, attach themselves around the person, you're basically there. It, that is basically what the graphite slate is. So it means that um, now Neris has taken possession of that, and she had the wonderful idea after the group decided to rest um, because they're all a bit beaten up after that particularly long fight on two fronts. They uh, decided to rest for the evening and get their strength back, and that also gave Neris time to attune to her um, to her new item, to Cadence's Graphite Slate, meaning that then she can transport Fleeting Look harmlessly uh, along on the uh, on the sl on the disc of magical force. Now, um, as you can probably guess, this is a custom item, uh, Cadence's Graphite Slate, and I'm just going to give you a little bit more about it now because I had to create it obviously to then put it into D and uh, D Beyond uh, for. Uh, uh, for Neris's uh, character profile, so um, uh, so it's obviously I, I've uh, had to create all of the stuff for it and all of the writing for it. So I might as well share it with you now, just to give you a, a little bit more of an insight into it. Okay, so Canis's graphite slate from is uh, a wondrous item. It's rare and can only be attuned by a spellcaster, uh, so it's an attunement item. From the outside, this would appear to be a small carbon tile, six inches in diameter. Um, that's the, the item that you hold, the material that you need to use to uh, create the disc. As an action, whilst holding the tile, you can use it to summon a disc of force within 30 feet of you. The disc is 3 feet in diameter and floats 3 feet from the ground, just like Tensor's floating disc. If this is summoned in the space of a medium or small creature, they must make a DC 20 strength saving throw or be restrained by magical tendrils that appear from the disc, strapping them to it. Once restrained in this way, the creature is also incapacitated as long as it is strapped to the disc. So they can't take any actions. They are rendered immobile. They're restrained and then they're incapacitated. The creature also has resistance to all damage except psychic damage, what damage while strapped to the disc. The restrained creature can be freed by another creature provided the be uh, they beat a DC 20 strength check. On a successful save, the disc occupies a space next to the creature. If a creature is large or larger, they cannot be restrained and automatically succeed on the saving throw. The disc can carry up to 500 pounds, but will disappear if this weight is exceeded. While you are within 20 feet of the disc, it is immobile, but if you move more than 20 feet from it, the disc will follow so that it remains within 20 feet of you. It can move across uneven terrain, up or down stairs, slopes and the like, but it can't cross an elevation change of 10 feet or more. For example, the disc can't move across a 10 foot deep pit, nor could it leave such a pit if it was created at the bottom. If you move more than 100 feet from the disc, typically because it can't move around an obstacle to follow you, the disc disappears, relinquishing the restrained creature. You can also dismiss the disc as an action. So, as you can see, similar to Tensor's Floating Disc, and I, I borrowed some of the uh, description for Tensor's Floating Disc because it's basically a rehashing of it. And uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Uh, I think... Um, if you if you think about uh, you know these great wizards crafting spells um, from way back when, there's they were with uh, with inventions in real life. There's always people who come to those uh, inventions and then start fine tuning them and putting their spin on it. And I kind of feel like that's kind of been the development of the graphite slate. Is it's taken the floating disc and gone, that's cool, but let's let's reshape it, let's rework it, and manufacture it into a different use. Uh, and so Cadence has done that. Cadence, um, this is not the first magic item of Cadence's that has appeared, as Seth also wears Cadence's magnificent vest, which uh, allows the wearer to cast minor illusion at will. So Cadence, clearly a character of some renown, a, a wizard or, al or artificer, something like that, um, who can create magical items. And uh, uh, I'm, uh, yeah, I think at some point that character's got to appear now, because... Uh, that's not just a one-off. That makes that so. It's got to appear in some form. So, I've got that in the back of my mind as some way that that will be introduced. Whether it's a character that the uh, char that the PCs talk to, or whether it'll be um, more sort of a, a law piece. Maybe Cadence existed hundreds of years ago and died long ago. Could be something like that, perhaps. Uh, but yes, all, all that to come in the future, I guess. So. Um, Overnight, while the group decided to camp out, um, they uh, really, this was, it was a nice change. And I've noticed that we have a kind of pacing, really, with our um, sessions, is that there's a, a big fight, uh, or a little fight, and then a little fight, and then a little fight. 
And then there's a, a nice bit of exploration, or sometimes exploration, then a big fight. And then uh, they all decide to have a nice rest, and there's the, the calm bit afterwards, a bit of role, pe- uh, role play and so on. And then they wake up, and either it's combat or it's exploration. Uh, and then, with some, uh, the, and then that, that's generally the ebb and flow, really. After a big fight, after a lot of excitement like that, things calm down, and we get a bit more role play going on. That seems to be the kind of ebb and flow currently. And I don't think there's, there's, a, there's an issue with that. It's certainly um, it's something that uh, you can change up every now and again uh, to keep people guessing for sure and i'm sure that'll be something uh, that will happen here as well but uh it's it's just nice to see that it's nice that we have these big role playing moments to kind of counteract these big combat sessions um which means that you know you've got a bit of something for everyone because you know dnd is kind of a i think is a broad church in the uh the kind of uh, players that it attracts to it um, there are certainly other games that you can play which are going to be more heavily weighted on one or the other but it's i think the balance of the two uh, is what makes it very special. And um, for those um, who would say uh, prefer Pathfinder, I've played Pathfinder um, Second Edition, and actually you know, it was good fun to play. I do feel it's a bit crunchier, a bit um, kind of meatier uh, in terms of the stats and the mechanics than D and D is, which is a bit more, uh, which has less detail. So it's you know it's lighter on on those uh, mechanics, but uh, it also means that it flows a little bit more. I think. Uh, but equally, it then means there's more breathing space, like I talked about earlier, for the role-playing side of things. Uh, I feel like perhaps, um, I think you could play Pathfinder with a, a heavy kind of role-play slant to it. But I just feel that there's, like, the the rule book is so dense uh, for, and it, it seems to be more catered towards the mechanics of combat uh, and that sort of thing than anything else. So it appears to me. I could be wrong, though. If you're a regular player of Pathfinder, please do get in touch and let me know what you think uh, about that by comparison to D&D. But for my money, for uh, um, for not taking so much of a deep dive uh, into the mechanics and rules, I feel that actually Dungeons and Dragons offers you that versatility and uh, that uh, a good balance between the two, for the most part. And I think that we've achieved that with this game. So um, anyway, uh, as the group are camping for the evening, uh, Brina then decides to uh, talk to her god, talk to Keith, otherwise known as Ominak, the god of truth, one of the eight great gods of the many lands. Uh, And he basically, in his roundabout casual kind of way, kind of warns her about Seth being quite mysterious because they're apparently he can see um, Ominak can see most things as god of truth but he couldn't see how um seth had managed to bring uh, uh had managed to cure his friend fleeting look of lycanthropy uh, or in fact um how Nerus had been brought back from the dead he that was something that was not within his control or observation which rang some alarm bells said he's being quite mysterious but then also re- reassured brina that the party's not all that bad yes they've murdered quite a few people but you know people who for the most part deserved it and equally um equally you know they've got a past but that doesn't mean they're born evil and in fact he says nobody is born evil um which is an interesting phrase from the god of truth i think that there's probably there's some merit in that um there are certainly he he, i think the important distinction though is that not uh, nobody as in no person is born evil rather than uh, a creature but then is a creature evil a good and evil are they just opinions yeah getting into some interesting territory there but the god of truth says that nobody's born evil so it must be truth right um but he also sympathized with uh Neris, who is kind of the most uh the most brooding and uh uh kind of um the most tortured soul really of the group and to, to be fair Neris has gone through quite a journey already i mean she died quite early on and then was brought back and then has the scar to prove it that she was kind of strangled around the neck um she's then uh, she's then slain her own art aunt by her own hands um although that was whilst being kind of deceived um by and enchanted by the uh, uh by the red mages uh, so you know kind of tricked into that and then uh she's also uh, then had her uncle be attacked by these bounty hunters and then she's burnt the corpses to ashes uh which is pretty dark but 
considering all that, she's also fled from home from her actual parents back in uh, Kothar to escape from the Red Mages. She's had a traumatic upbringing, and that's kind of what uh, what Keith was emphasising to uh, to Brina that you know she's she's a little scary, but she's been through a lot. She's she's not all that bad, really. Um, but speaking of Seth and Nerys, these two characters in particular are going down a dark path, and that seemed to be reflected by the strange dreams they had, kind of nightmarish dreams, really. Uh, for Seth, it was more water-themed, where all of the uh, all of his past uh, victims, sorry, uh, the people that he had killed and creatures that he had killed, were just one by one falling into the water, uh, of which he was he was under the under the water trying to bring back. Uh, fleeting look who's who's down there unconscious he was trying to save him and then suddenly all these bodies start falling in and then he's hearing the creepy old voice his patron now uh, as he's taking a level of warlock Ooh. Uh, telling him good good Seth I'll be back in one second I'm just going to a quick call <laughs> back that was an important phone call i'm now booked in for some stuff next week yay but uh that aside anyway where was i so um so yeah seth having these uh, this spooky dream of all of his uh, past kills kind of being uh, uh, dropped into the water uh and then uh, the old voice kind of cheering him on like yes seth, yes words of encouragement excellent good uh, not evil at all. And then when Seth turns back to Fleeting Look, instead of, of his friend, the turquoise tiefling, he's replaced by a knight in pure black uh, plate armour um, with these blue orbs for eyes that suddenly burst into flame uh, and kind of holding out one hand towards him going, Stop! Stop! Just, yeah, like that. Um, uh which is uh, a little disconcerting. And then Neris uh, had a more fire-themed dream, seeing the three bounty hunters s pleading with her uh, for mercy and then her just burning them to ashes and uh, in the fire and flames hearing Damon saying words of encouragement, laughing and cheering her on and then seeing uh, in front of her the, um, the, a great ancient red dragon in the flames grinning towards her. And then... Out of the flames, suddenly uh, more uh, water starts to cascade into the area, flooding the area. But the fire is then uh, kind of like uh, flaming oil. It's just the flames are still there, but on top of the water. And everyone um, uh, and the same figure, the knight in the black plate armor, appears in the fire uh, and 
tells her to stop. Now, this wasn't covered in the session because, unfortunately, uh, Marta wasn't there for the session, but I then messaged her afterwards with this. Um, so this is kind of a little bit of inside intel for you. Uh, and this same knight appears uh, and tells uh, and tells her that to basically tells her to stop spawn of Ushtag. That's what uh, that's what he says. Now the relevance of that uh, is that Ushtag the Deceiver was the great ancient dragon uh, that enslaved a lot of the many lands. He was the conqueror of much of the many lands in the time of the dragons. Uh, he deceived the other dragons uh, and one by one managed to kind of take over their areas and drove them out and killed them uh, until he was the only dragon left and that's when he had occupation of Kothar which you can see on the map here just down in the corner the red zone and also in uh, the Dragonborn King what's now the Dragonborn Kingdom of Wuchir he uh, took over there as well so clearly a fearsome individual but it seems that uh, uh, Neris who is a draconic sorcerer chronic bloodline it's being claimed by this knight that she is the spawn of ushtag which is obviously quite worrying anyway uh, so seth and neris both wake up abruptly neris obviously coming out of her trance seth actually waking up from sleep uh, and kind of seth tries to kind of communicate with her and ask ask her you know what she's been doing about uh, but she's her usual self and uh, uh, a bit reserved and reticent to give away information uh, but she does ha um, sort of, uh, without thinking, draw a symbol, uh, this orb with the flames around it, with a uh, with an arrow she's fletched in the ground. And then Seth recognizes this because it's one of the, it's the only one of the eight that he has any interest in, which is Agrifor, uh, the god of the struggle, the uh, god of the war domain. Uh, the struggle being that it's the struggle to maintain the balance between the two sides is kind of the 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 thinking behind that. Um, he is uh, the god um, of justice as well. So he was the god of lawmakers. He's very much lawful but neutral. He you know, stands his ground in the center, not taking one side or the other in the battle between good and evil. Uh, and so that's probably one of the reasons why it's taken quite a while for him to appear. Or perhaps it's just that these people haven't been considered important enough until this point for Agrifal to actually make some contact with them or intervene in what they're doing. Also, a bit of trivia in the many lands, Agrifal's justice is uh, a term for execution, uh, and it is uh, it is well known that uh, Agrifal's justice is is to be executed. Uh, although um, although that's not saying that every law that if you break any rules you'll be executed. That's not necessarily it, but it is the ultimate uh, it is the ultimate punishment. So uh, there you go, a little bit of trivia there. So they have uh, those dreams. And then uh, there's, uh, meanwhile, the rest of the party have a much more peaceful slumber. And Brucon again, uh, has a vision of the scales, the balance being the path that he follows, so the way, uh, the, uh, way of the balance. And, the, uh, and that is kind of the constant uh, uh, upkeep of the balance between the light and the dark, or you could say the good and the evil, but I guess that depends on opinion. But the light and the darkness are in constant flux. Uh, and in uh, competition with each other and so the uh, as a guardian of the light he has to uh, make sure that that is not to make sure that light overcomes dark but to make sure that light is not quelled by darkness it's to kind of keep maintain order and balance between those two but it seems the scales have been tipped towards the meteor that they saw flying overhead when malar was uh, trying to save um trying to save fleeting look that meteor crashed into the mountainside uh, and it seems that the scales were tipped towards that crash site. So clearly uh, a forewarning uh, to the party that there is something amiss there and uh, it needs to be checked out. And certainly they've taken that advice on board from that dream. Leo, meanwhile, Leo Berin has got a whole different thing going on to those guys. His dream was of the Feywild and of his patron and uh, baby mama and lady love or uh, or lady that he at least feels he needs to prove his love to, uh, or you know, do the right thing by um, Lady Aranth First Blooming, who is one of the Fey of the Spring Court. Um, but when he, when he sees her, he only sees the back of her head. When she turns around, it's revealed to be the old crone that he say uh, that he uh, gave the crystal ball to only the previous night, and she taunts him cackles at him, but also gives him a magical gift, passing her hand over him. 
And this gift is meant to be a sort of internal compass so that he may then find their missing sister. She's trying to uh, reunite her other two sisters in a meeting together, a coven, if you will. Uh, the three of them need to be together at this meeting to uh, restore the Oberyn's powers, so they say. And that, that is the promise that uh, he, he, the first test was to find the Pearl of Power on the caravan, which he did. And the next test now is to find the missing sister. And when he does that, so that he needs to deliver her a message that they are to meet and that the Oberyn is the subject of their meeting. That's what he's told. And that seems that all seems fine. But then it gets a little bit strange when he uh, then kind of sees from a bird's eye view almost from the outside the spring court sees lady aranth wandering through there yet he's trapped outside of the spring court itself which seems to be in a kind of bubble like a snow globe and he is there on the outside looking in unable to get to her and then every person that aranth uh, walks past in the spring court suddenly turns into the crow and then starts cackling up at leobrin uh, until there is a whole court full of people laughing at him um which, let's face it, is a little bit disturbing. Uh, what are the ramifications of that? Don't want to give too much away here, uh, but you know, I think you can join the dots here about three sisters wanting to meet to restore powers. They are Fae, they are Trixie, uh, and uh, what will be the cost? Because magic, there's always a cost with magic, and uh, unless it's a cantrip. Uh, so <laughs> uh, what is going to be the cost here? Having Leo's powers returned but what does that mean for his relationship with Lady Aranth? That's the real question. So uh, that will be explored later on. Uh, that's not for the immediate uh, uh, objective, but it's certainly something to think about longer term. So uh, in the morning, with most of the party having a restful sleep, they decide to um, leave the cart behind because uh, now the steep incline up the mountain begins and it's just going to be impractical to take that with them. Um, but, uh, as I said, Nerys can use the graphite slate to take fleeting look with them uh, without any issue. Um, they then uh, spot another patrol of, uh, of Aracocra accompanied by Manticore as they uh, as they begin their ascent they a few hours into their ascent to be fair when they notice this patrol and they all decide to hide now so they've been accompanied by two aracocra monks uh the two who they captured from the uh, uh original uh, trying to abduct uh um bell quickly back in hilberg the gnome um and they have since found those two aracocra called kerr and beak who have been kind of guides to them in a sense or, or certainly have tagged along and could be useful allies i mean they can fly for one thing which is handy um and then <laughs> due to a natural 20 and a natural one respectively kerr hides immediately and very well and beak just kind of is stuck holding the baby looking around like what's going on here while the rest of the party scatters and hides and so in a panic he then flies up into the air to try and escape from the patrol but instead catches their attention and then is immediately captured now on the, actually um although this is bad for beak that he's been beaten up knocked unconscious and taken away um it's a good thing for the rest of the party because him drawing attention to himself takes the attention away from the rest of them and so he kind of has sacrificed himself to help the rest of the group and sure enough once he was captured the patrol went back to base uh, back to the eerie with him in tow and mean means the path was clear for the rest of the party but this meant that uh, uh they then were going to have to continue on without him and the ascent was only going to get more difficult but instead they were joined by somebody they were actually meaning to save bantam quigley who as it turns out is a druid um had turned himself into a mouse uh, and had then um and had escaped from the eerie uh, all by himself because apparently the cages are fairly rudimentary that he, he was kept in so turning into a small into a tiny little mouse he could just scuttle out of there no no problem at all uh, and so, yeah, then ends up finding the rest of the party uh, and then is kind of uh, a guide of sorts. He can now tell them, uh, how, he's, he's given them information about how to get into uh, the area or the, or the way that he got out anyway. Uh, but it was also warned about uh, stuff on the path. There are a few challenges on the path. The, in fairness, the Aracocra monks have already said this, that there are uh, challenges. The, the path is meant to be a test for would-be monks of the monastery. Uh, because Aracocra obviously are a uh, flying 
bird people. They, uh, as as their test, they have to walk the path with their wings uh, pinned back, so they're not they can't fly uh, as part of the test. Meaning that they have to use their physical uh, abilities and endurance uh, and so on, uh, problem solving abilities to overcome the path. And then, uh, when they get to the end of the path, they are then greeted with open arms to the monastery. That is the the test. Uh, and so. There are a few challenges to look out for, and it seems those challenges have only increased uh, with the meteor crashing into the mountainside. So uh, um, Bantam also noted that there seems to be a strange elemental energy. A lot uh, there is a air elemental energy in particular is very strong here. Uh, noting in the center of the area, which is very kind of uh, like the hollowed out um, uh, uh, inside of uh, like a dormant volcano. Uh, that and within the center of that there is a raised uh, bit of rock and uh, ground and turf uh, which then has one great tree on it uh, with uh, I think I think I said it was pink leaves it's pink or purple I will double check but anyway I, I'm going to say pink leaves it's very unusual but also the fact that this this piece of ground is floating like 20 30 feet in the air is very odd like it shouldn't be it shouldn't be just floating there that doesn't make any sense unless elemental air is uh, very strong there and perhaps that's what's causing it he also noted on his way out that it seemed that there are air gusts that come from within the volcano uh, uh, sorry within the mountain and come out cracks uh, along the outside kind of fissures uh, along the uh, the sides of the of the mountain and across some of the path as well and the the uh, party experienced that firsthand in the last session as they did quite a lot of mountain climbing. Uh, uh, and uh, whilst you think on the face of it, that means that uh, anyone with a high athletics score is going to be fine here. That certainly helped, but there were other challenges as well. If you if you fluffed a roll, it was then going to be like a strength save to try and save yourself. There was a couple of dexterity saving throws and checks to overcome obstacles as well. Uh, and equally, some problem solving. And actually, uh, Brina, the uh, the gnome wizard and uh, Angelique, the guest star on, on the, the show at the moment, uh, really kind of came into the element as a problem solver because one they could they had a uh, they fashioned the party fashioned a papoose uh, onto uh, Kerr so that she could then be carried by the Aracocra flying in the air with her strapped to him uh, and then she could observe from afar what was going on which means also because she's quite clumsy means that there's less chance of her falling down the uh, or off the mountain which would be a disaster because she would probably die if she fell off the mountain um but equally it meant that she could get a kind of bird's eye view and then aid the party in uh, overcoming obstacles and actually uh, it meant that she spotted these uh, blasts of air coming from uh, out of the mountain on the particularly tough climb that the guys had they had two climbers kits between them and it proved that that was enough and also they had a lot of rope and finally most of that rope has got used um, during the ascent as they've left it in place for when they go back later hopefully but uh, there were some hairy moments where uh, uh, with various characters uh, either falling or rope coming loose or rocks that their ropes were tied to coming off it was all a bit touch and go but it for the most part everyone got up there fine there were some really good uses of spells actually uh, as well in the session uh special mentions need to go to um to uh to leobrin for casting tongues on Kerr, because that meant now finally the aracocra can understand what everyone else is saying and everyone can understand what the aracocra is saying um because he can't speak common uh and then also to uh Brina, who they, the group decided to leave Fleeting Look behind because obviously strapped to the disc, they it's not going to be able to ascend up a mountain. It's not going to happen, at least on the vertical climbs, there's no way. So they decided to leave him in a crag with the horse, uh, with Horsey, and with his uh, noble steed, the Dire Capybara, and Brina cast Alarm uh, on that little camp there as well. So they'll be notified if Fleeting Look leaves there or if anyone else enters that area so kind of a wise use there uh, and really uh, uh the biggest sort of uh thing for overcoming difficulty on the climb was malar casting uh enhanceability on himself uh because that meant that his he's already quite strong but it meant that he had uh advantage on his strength checks meant meaning that he could then carry Neris around his neck uh, or hanging off of his neck basically and climb all the way up 
the uh, this uh, the two stages without much trouble. Um, I think he fell off once, um, which was a bit hairy, but fortunately, um, Neris managed to get out of the way of, of being crushed by him. But um, but other than that, I think thing that was a really good call using that spell, and it meant that he uh, didn't have too many problems because equally his dexterity score is really bad. So. You know, there was a there was a danger that if he failed a dex save that he could end up falling plummeting off the side of a mountain which is never a good look but uh eventually the players got to the got to the path and that's kind of where we ended the last session when they get to the path uh because uh a voice they heard telepathically in their minds took their attention from when they got to the top of the path. Now, Brina and Kerr got there first because they flew up to the top to then peg in some rope uh, for and a piton for everyone so that everyone can use that, or piton, so that everyone can climb up that. And they heard the voice telepathically in their heads, although they, although Brina couldn't understand what it was saying, but it sounded very gross, like... <laughs> not a language she understands and not something that sounds very of this world. But Kerr, because tongues was cast on him, and I forgot originally, but we retroactively worked out that he had he could understand what they were saying. Uh, and all, all he got was that they were saying, help, help me. What could that mean? Now, uh, the meteor and uh, and the creature that comes out of it has been triggered by fate dice. And this is one of the first fate dice. Uh, for those of you who don't know what fate dice is, there's the hashtag fate dice. You can get your suggestions into Fate Dice on our Discord server. That's on the Slice and Dice Discord. There is a channel called Fate Dice, and people put their suggestions there for Fate Dice. And every once in a while, I'll roll a d20, and whatever number comes up will correspond to one of those Fate Dice suggestions. But this one isn't on the Fate Dice Discord server because it's one of the options that came up before it was on Discord, before Discord suggestions were a thing. Uh, and uh, this meant that those who, who who had suggested it or thought they knew what it was were particularly scared, and I think that that, that's, that got confirmed by then, as the rest of the party got up there, Neris could then understand the voice, uh, because there's one language she's taken which uh, she doesn't know how she knows that. It's, it's like she doesn't know how she can understand what this thing is saying, but she can, and that's a bit disturbing. Uh, I don't want to say which language. I feel that I'll give it away too much. But uh, um, stay tuned because uh, there is some aberrant shenanigans going on next time with that. So that's uh, that's it's going to be interesting to see how the party handle that because on the one hand, uh, the players think they know what they're up against. But the player characters obviously won't know. They won't have come across this kind of creature before. So uh, it, it's, I think they're, they're, there's that internal struggle with that. Um, but I think they're doing fine. And I think they, they know that they're not going to know. Their characters aren't going to know what this creature is. So they can't, you know, meta it too much. Um, but equally, it's the kind of... Th that, doesn't, that doesn't mean there's going to be no tension there. Because if anything, there's going to be more tension. Because they're like, I know what this is, but my character doesn't. And I don't want to go here. But I have no reason why my character wouldn't go here. And so a creature asking for help. You know, for instance, Mala was like, well, they're asking for help. We've got to go help them. Because that's what they do. He's supposed to be a hero. He's supposed to be a good guy. You help people in need. That's what good people should do, right? Uh, and so if it's an cr evil creature that's asking for help ah moral questions uh so uh yeah that's going to be interesting to see how they pick that apart and how which route they decide to go on um i'm excited i hope you are as well um as i said um at the beginning now we're going fortnightly with the manylands campaign and i'm already like oh, i wish it was weekly again but i just physically can't do it um just with the the time i have and as i said i think on reflection in conclusion i think that actually by us going to fortnightly with it rather than weekly i think it would just mean that the sessions there'll be, it'll be better quality of session will probably go a bit longer each session as well because there won't be as many um but also i think that it would just mean that i'll be approaching it and the rest of the players will be approaching it with the correct mindset every time we'll be there we'll have had enough time to kind of to miss playing to then you know want to come back to the table and enjoy it uh, and equally, uh, it's it's good for the players as well because it means there's not so much pressure on them. They don't have to book off every Monday to play D and D. I don't need to book off every Monday to play D and D um, because you know 
even with a national lockdown, there is a lot of stuff to do. Uh, and I keep on finding more and more stuff and committing myself to more and more stuff. So it's uh, so I think actually, it, all things considered, this will be a good thing. A, it would definitely be a positive move for the channel and I hope you agree and continue to support as you have done so far it really has meant a lot and uh, I'm continually humbled by uh, the comments by the uh, by the followship the subscribing all of that so thank you all so much it really does mean a lot I know I say that I know I say it really does mean a lot a lot but it does it really does uh, it's why we do it Anyway, as I said, so that's enough for uh, today's uh, campaign diary roundup. But as I said, tune in on Monday. Uh, if you can't do it live on Twitch here, come join us on YouTube. That's where the premiere will be. If you haven't subscribed to YouTube, do so right now uh, because then you'll be notified straight away when our um, uh, when our premiere of The Cage Session 4 goes live. The Cage, right there. Uh, subscribe now to be notified. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, as I said, it's a good fun session. It's a long session, but it's a damn good one. Come join us for that at Monday at 6 p.m. on YouTube. Anyway, until next time, guys, thank you all so much. Have a great weekend. And of course, stay safe. Bye. <laughs>